Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Uh, if you're watching this in October, happy Cybersecurity Month. Uh, I am, of course, Adam Ansor, and I'm joined here with our guest, uh, Scott McDaniel from Simple Helix. Hey, Scott, how are you today? Doing well. How are you doing, Adam? Very, very good. Thank you. Uh, we're going to give it a couple seconds for people to join. I'm going to keep the slide where up here, which I'm going to periodically bring down. Uh, and, of course, uh, just give a couple people uh, some opportunities to just make sure they get in. Start in just a few seconds. Now, while we're uh, sort of waiting for people to collect in, um, I want to make sure that uh, we understand that the format is that uh, we're essentially going to be uh, almost like an interview style. Uh, and we're going to have some slide where we're going to save Q&A for the end. Um, the uh, presentation here also has a, a number of key giveaways. Make sure you're paying attention near the end because at the bottom there, there's going to be uh, you know, a CMMC tracker. Uh, which is a uh, sort of project plan. It, it offers an opportunity for you to sort of work with your system security plan to uh, essentially assess yourself, which is going to be the goal uh, of this presentation is try to make sure you can start making decisions. Um, we are also going to have Q&A near the end where uh, you can ask Scott or myself questions uh, about anything we covered today. All right, I think we've been, uh, you know, open for a little while, so we're just going to get started. So welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to talk about CMMC compliance and how to achieve the right level. Uh, we're going to take on two different perspectives today. Um, we've got an MSP provider in Simple Helix uh, who has addressed many of the different CMMC, um, you know, controls. And we have uh, an MDR provider, Intelligo Networks, uh, where I work, uh, which has also done a, a similar viewpoint. But we tend to look at these challenges a little bit differently. And so when you look at addressing these controls yourself, um, we want you to be able to understand whether you already address a particular control or uh, you think you need a, a, a provider and which one would offer uh, the shortest time and least complexity for you in achieving your own uh, level of compliance. Um, so just to reiterate, my name is Adam Mansour. I'm a VCSO, virtual CISO with Intelligo Networks. We are a managed detection and response company. We basically take in data, find and stop threats on behalf of companies. Um, and um, Scott from Simple Helix is also here. Scott, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, Scott McDaniel, the Vice President of Technology with Simple Helix. We at Simple Helix, we are a managed service provider, and we also operate our own Tier 3 data center in Huntsville, Alabama with the true focus at compliance. Awesome. Excited to have you here. So the agenda is going to be to go through uh, the controls covered uh, by the teams, um, also to look at you know the IT management perspective of addressing those controls, giving you a little bit of experience, a little bit of indication as to when you might want uh, an IT outsourcer. Uh, and so Scott's going to cover th that angle. I'm going to cover the cybersecurity perspective here. We're also going to you know, offer a uh, self-assessment and consultation at the end uh, of this. So if you're looking to assess yourself against these controls and understand whether or not you could use a provider like us, uh, there's some free giveaways to help you do that. We're also going to give you some examples of easy and complex controls just to give you a taste of you know, what some of these controls might mean in terms of the sort of setup, time, resources, people, process, technology uh, that are involved in some of the more difficult uh, level five, level four uh, type questions. Um, so uh, then we're going to leave it up to Q&A. So let's get started. CMMC, uh, if you're on the phone uh, looking at this, you're likely uh, looking at this as part of, you know, addressing customer concerns around your own uh, IT and security practices. Uh, now, when you look at this, there are a number of different ways that the controls can be addressed, either individually by yourself or uh, in conjunction with a partner, an MSP, IT outsourcer, or uh, you know, an MDR provider are examples of the type of providers you can go to. You can also, also obviously seek things like consultation. Um, we want to be able to focus on capabilities uh, and the types of things that enable these types of controls. So just looking at the color-coded graph here, you kind of understand how many controls are out there uh, that, that could be addressed by one uh, or more parties. Now, this is all going to be in the spreadsheet at the end of this, so don't feel like you have to take these down or ask which specific controls. All this is included in the giveaway at the end um, to help you understand uh, when to reach out to a, a particular provider, including assessing yourself. Now, uh, Scott, I'm going to turn it over to you really quickly and just talk about, you know, why would uh, a customer want to achieve uh, CMMC compliance? Yeah, so the main driver for CMMC compliance is this mandate that is coming down from the DOD 
historically, you know, if you were um, in the defense industrial base and you were working on either as a subcontractor or as a prime on a DOD contract, you might have been familiar with the previous model of DFARS that is getting changed to CMMC. And the fundamental change with CMMC over DFARS is this concept that a third party assessor will come and they say assess, I'd like to say audit your business. And really at the end of the day, you have to have that CMMC certification if you want to continue doing work in the DOD space. You know, when you look at the, uh, the you know, options for people, they you know there's, there's levels there, right? And so when you look at the process, you know, a lot of people on the phone today are, are either looking to get started or they're looking to understand it a little bit more deeply. What's your advice on where people should start with this if they haven't already sort of, you know, assessed themselves? Yeah. So one of the great things about CMMC over DFARS is that DFARS was a all or none compliance standard. So it really didn't matter what it was that you were doing with the DOD or in the defense industrial base, you either did all the controls and, or you didn't do, do them. And it was very black and white. With CMMC, it introduces the concept of levels such that if say, you know, you are maybe a prime contractor, you would have to go to a very high level, the highest being level five. If you're a subcontractor and you're doing something that involves getting data from the DOD directly in order to, you know, make the, the new thing, right? So maybe it's, you know, specifications for a mechanical option, or maybe you're gotta go develop software and they're gonna give you some data so you can develop that software. You might be a level three. And then if you're a supplier, right? You're the guy that just provides raw materials and things like that, there's an option for you to be level one. And so with that, you know, the first step towards this is actually trying to figure out, you know, what level um, you're going to be, but what they've shared with us is that, you know, over 80% of the de defense industrial base will be some level between one and three. Awesome. Now, I guess for a lot of people on the call, you know, this can get pretty sales pitchy. So we're going to make sure that you understand. We want to make sure you know when you are fulfilling a particular requirement. That's why we created you know, our tracker to help you understand where you're at and to help you understand where we're at without having to ask us and get all kinds of decks and mappings and everything. Do, do your own gap analysis. But for people who are watching this, uh, when do you think a partnership is necessary? What does a partnership necessarily look like, Scott? Yeah. And then, you know, with that, you know, we also get asked here at Simple Helix quite frequently, well, are there parts and pieces of this I can do myself? Uh, you know, does it all have to be outsourced? And there's absolutely uh, parts and pieces that you can do yourself. So, you know, you could, in theory, do like your own gap assessment, for example, right? So you can get a copy of the standard, you can read the standard, you can start understanding the I call controls, they call practices, they're the same thing. And you, you can definitely start going down that path. Um, what we typically see quite frequently is that people do that and go, wow, this is pretty overwhelming. Uh, I would like to bring in some partnership and uh, have some guidance. And that's, you know, kind of where, you know, Adam and, and myself, we kind of come in and start saying, yeah, we can absolutely help you through this process. Because at the end of the day, you gotta be able to document and say what it is that you're doing from a cyber hygiene perspective. And then of course, you gotta prove that you're doing what you say you do. and you know, at CMMC level three, there's 130 controls or practices that, you know, have to be addressed. And so from that perspective, you know, you may decide, yeah, I don't want to go do this all by myself. It would be nice to have, you know, some expertise come in and guide us through the process. Awesome. Now, for those of you on the phone that are not part of the cyber defense space, you don't work with the DOD, should you still care about the CMMC uh, and what it's done uh, as one of the newer compliance frameworks out of there. 
And, you know, when we look at this from a cybersecurity perspective, and I mean the threats that are going to shut down your business, ransomware, exfiltration of your data, breaches that you have to notify depending on your state or your province or your country, there's always a, a focus on, you know, your vertical specific reason to do something, right? I got a credit card, I'm going to do PCI. I got ISO, I'm part of a you know, government mandate to do ISO. Um, or I don't, you know, have all the tools to audit myself like an InfoSec officer. I might go with something a little simpler like CSS. Or maybe you're buying something like antivirus software and you want to pick another framework like MITRE. All these acronyms, they're really, you know, uh, specific to sometimes a particular mandate from your company. But what I want to stress here is that CMMC also helps companies manage their risk overall, manage these threats. And all it takes is just a little understanding of how the attack lifecycle works and the thinking that goes into these protections. And when you think about how an attacker comes into your network and they get access to your critical systems, your data, your credentials, they try to establish themselves inside your environment and essentially deploy you know, malicious software or exfiltrate uh, sensitive data and, and either hold it ransom or um, you know, uh, simply fence it on the black market. There's a number of reasons why when you look at CMMC and you were to say, let's take that exact process and let's map the maturity levels of CMMC doing the more difficult things is also doing uh, protecting you from some of the more critical issues, right? So you think about ransomware and the kinds of controls that would attack and defend or finding an attacker that's trying to break into your environment. Um, CMMC can also help you understand your maturity that way. The other benefit to CMMC, if you're a retailer or you're working through another compliance standard, is that it maps out, right? There are a lot of things in common with the CMMC uh, standard and other standards out there, right? ISO, PCI, NIST 853, or the FedRAMP program, 800-171, which if you went through DFARS, you probably heard about 800-171. You're probably wondering what happened to 800-171. So we've also included this mapping inside of the, the tracker so you can get a feel for, hey, if I do this, what am I getting in terms of other controls? And, you know, like Scott said, it's a great place to go because it's got a progression scale. It's got a maturity model. You don't have to just do everything at once and one failure loses you the whole game. You can use this as a multi-year, maybe multi-month mapping program to look at your own cyber protection uh, and keep yourself secure uh, without having to do everything at once. You can say, look, this is a reasonable milestone. We'll hit level three for the end of the year, and then we might go to level five, right? But, you know, for buying criteria, if you are in that DOT space, you're going to want to hit the level requisite with your contract obligations, right? The people that you're doing business with. So all that to wrap up and just quickly say uh, before we get into individual controls, uh, what are we hoping you do at the end of this webinar? Grab the tracker, self-assess, fill it out, right? Register for a free consultation with us. We will walk you through a control or a question or, you know, a, a system and, and ways to achieve things. Uh, as fast and as cheaply as as, uh, as we know how to do. And hopefully that allows you to, to be in the driver's seat for making a decision about uh, a project plan, what you should do next uh, to, to, achieve this, uh, to achieve this goal. Uh, but as you get into that, of course, there are a couple of pitfalls. We wanna talk about some of the ways in which you, you're gonna hit that inflection point. Uh, Scott, I wanna turn it over to you and just talk about you know, one or two controls that, uh, that you see as, as good examples of controls um, that you may not think you can apply, but it could take just, you know, a very fast and quick, uh, you know, helping hand from a, a team uh, that has had experience with that. Yeah, thanks. Um, so with that, um, you know, with like us at Simple Helix, you know, our typical, uh, where we fit into this equation would typically be around implementation. Right. So, you know, you've gone through that gap assessment, you've looked over these controls and you're going, OK, I, I know that there's some stuff missing. Um, and then, you know, we at Simple Helix, we could come in and start bringing in, you know, the technology, the services and things to go close those gaps. So what I wanted to do is just kind of cherry pick a couple controls and kind of show how there's a balance between, hey, there's some things that you could go do yourself that uh, are kind of low hanging fruit, but then there's a, another other controls that are more challenging where you go, you know, maybe there's a, a better way to do this and maybe the partnership and an MSP could help me do that. So to start with like an easy one, when you do get to CMMC level three, one of the requirements is that you employ spam protection for all your email. 
And I would say that the majority of us in 2020 uh, would not even accept operating a business without some level of spam protection. And even to that point, if you're already got your email on Google G Suite or you're using O365, spam protection is just organically there, right? So you probably already have that in place now you just got to go and validate it and say yeah if it's configured correctly um then document that yeah the the spam protection comes from g suite it comes from o365 and we've gone and checked the boxes to make sure that it's turned on and yes people are seeing the messages are spam filtered where things get a little bit maybe more complicated and you know there's things that we've learned that you know, could be valuable in terms of, you know, just letting somebody like a Simple Helix or a managed service provider do for you is when you get a little bit further down the road. So there's another um, control that specifically calls out that you have, what it, it just says is what you got to do is you got to terminate user sessions after a defined condition. So what's really buried in that somewhat vague and ambiguous language is things like if you have a VPN tunnel, the VPN tunnel can't stay up forever. There's got to be a timeout that says, hey, if there's been a, no activity, make sure you turn the VPN tunnel back off. Uh, if you've opened a web browser and you're checking email through the web interface, there's some sort of timeout that says, hey, after an idle time, it goes, right? Same thing with, yeah, you need to get your uh, screensaver to, you know, lock out. And so all of those things, again, is something that you could go configure manually by yourself. But what we would do is we would say, well, there's got to be a better way because eventually all the laptops for the organization have to have these things set. And it's really tedious to go set that manually on each and every laptop. Maybe there's a better way. And so we would come in and we would say, okay, well, there is a better way. What we could do is we could join those devices into a device management tool. So like using a specific example inside of Microsoft Office 0365, there's a device management tool called Intune. So then what we would do is help get all the laptops and cell phones and everything registered into Intune. And then we go into Intune and we build the policy that says, hey, the screensaver has to kick on forcefully after 10 minutes of idle time. And of course, you know, you get the choice of what that actual time is, but it becomes a much more efficient way. And what we find is, you know, the, the act of configuring Intune might be out of scope for you guys. So we could step in, we can get the Intune environment up and running, we get the devices enrolled, and then that leaves you with, yeah, I just have to set this policy. That's great, yeah. And I, I mean, you imagine one avenue, you're chasing every application, every single possible, you know, login and, and looking at a, a, you know, some sort of session timeout from this LinkedIn account, you know, we use it for marketing, right? So you, you could broaden the scope or, you know, you could, you could use a helping hand to kind of scope out, hey, this is, you know, a better way to deal with these problems and, and others in conjunction, right? Because you're going to have uh, ways to map tooling to this as well. When we look at it from a cyber perspective, a lot of people see the more difficult things uh, for a provider like a managed detection response provider uh, as, as simply handling the sort of fours and fives, right? The way that the, the uh, levels are broken out is that each category usually has, you know, level two, level three, level one in it, right? So if we look at risk management and incident response as two categories in cybersecurity, it gives you kind of an understanding of, you see how things ladder up, right? And, you know, when you're trying to achieve something like, level four, uh, it's important when people are making the decision for themselves, hey, I should be level three, because that's going to help me get more contracts. Uh, but level four and level five can help you stop the vast majority of, of human uh, created threats, right? Attackers that are using new tactics, ransomware as a service, et cetera. So when you look at things like, you know, um, in risk management, uh, level four, uh, control 150, it has an example about using threat intelligence. And a lot of people know that, you know, some uh, threat intelligence feeds are you know, free and, and they can download stuff from DHS, et cetera. But the control asks you to make sure that you're using it in monitoring, in threat hunting, 
and in response, meaning you're actively blocking things uh, using a threat intelligence feed. That's quite a difficult task for a company that probably doesn't have um, you know, an incident response uh, team or an individual dedicated uh, threat hunting team, right? Um, and so in those cases, you know, you look at those protections and say, maybe I don't want level four and five, but this is really high value stuff from protecting your actual networks and environment, right? Similarly, uh, when an incident does happen, if you see something flagged by your antivirus or firewall, it asks you to utilize forensic data in gathering you know, uh, information about um, the data and whether it's access to look for transfers, things like that, right? Forensic data isn't just in your systems, right? This is the kind of stuff that can be wiped or removed. And so it kind of involves collecting it all the way along and making sure that there's all kinds of monitoring to make sure you have an unbroken pipeline of your data going somewhere else other than your assets, right? Another strong reason to look at if something does happen, you need that flight recorder, you also need the team looking at it. So these things kind of work in conjunction with one another uh, and likely are things that you might look at and say, well, that's really difficult. Luckily, I don't have to do that. Understanding though that this is a very good way to prevent uh, very specific cyber attacks from hitting you. Another component, of course, is that you know that you look at these other requirements. Say, okay, I got the threat intelligence. Maybe you have forensic data being collected, but they also want you to look at it, right? There's going to be the idea that you're going to be researching attacker techniques as part of this. Uh, you know, one of the other controls in IR. Another one saying you need 24/7 response capability. You know how do you how do you prove to an auditor that you have that right? You're going to have to have uh, at least a staffing arrangement or a call, page your system, something. And quite honestly, when you look at you know using attacker tactics and, and and you know maybe something like the MITRE framework, it's a fairly advanced thing to just deploy, right? Some people just say we'll buy a sim and we'll go into it when something happens. And they're saying no, you you have to have a procedure to uh, do this kind of stuff daily and and look at and advance these rules against. Uh, changing behaviors, because that's what it takes to block the new kinds of ransomware. Now, if you consider this against your normal operation, uh, most companies would be happy with dealing with an alert uh, and probably, you know, doing some forensic investigation at the time the alert is sent to their staff. But what the CMMC is saying, and a lot of cybersecurity uh, uh, personnel are saying, is that these advanced persistent threats, the threats that are actually targeting this defense base, are really focused on changing the tactics to get around prevention tools, your antivirus, your firewall, the things that would generate an alert or automatically block something. And so it is this event space that they are telling you to you know, use threat hunting and you know, advanced tools uh, to do, and to make sure that when you get an alert, you're utilizing forensic to stop it all before somebody can deploy something like ransomware or essentially what we call material damage, right? Causing you an outage or stealing your data and you have to notify of a breach. So when you look at this and say, you know, interpretation of these standards and interpretation of what you're getting out of them uh, may dictate whether or not you think you're getting better value out of a provider rather than just more compliance, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Now I'm just going to recap again, um, CMMC implementation is easier when you have experience in not only interpreting controls, but applying them through tools, whether they are IT tools, things you already have, think disk encryption, think anti-spam, think, you know, Intune and, and policies in your Windows directory that you probably haven't, you know, taken a look at since set up uh, cybersecurity capabilities, you know, training your staff and building out a threat hunting team and, you know, advanced tactics to block attackers to meet, uh, you know, the, the full-time job of an attacker head on with the same skill set, quite difficult to put in house specifically when uh, you're, you're looking at protecting the operation from those advanced attacks. It's probably just not cost efficient, right? And that's, that's really all we're saying is evaluate what you have and what you're doing and, you know, prove it to yourself, right? Understand for yourself whether those kinds of things are acceptable risks for you or, uh, you know, within the, the current purview of your assessment or if, like most people we talk to, you know, you're in a rush to get as much done as fast as you can. And it's simply faster and better and easier to just get it done uh, with some help. Now we're going to just uh, go over some of our resources. Uh, again, I know we kind of pitched it three times, but just to hammer what the point of this session is, please download our tracker. It doesn't have any spyware in it. We're not going to watch you, you know, filling it out or anything. It's just you know a spreadsheet so that you can fill out the controls and, and help yourself understand your current status. Uh, we also produce white paper. There's content coming out from us all the time, but a white paper on manufacturing uh, and cybersecurity and, and that threat landscape that, that we keep talking about from a risk perspective uh, that, you know, is really kind of human driven. And, and the horror stories you hear 
um, we really want to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. So check out our white paper as well uh, and, and, and um, the resources at the bottom of the page. Scott, you've also got some great things for everyone. You want to talk about those? Yeah, absolutely. So from the Simple Helix side, you know, definitely check out our guide to understanding CMMC compliance. So, you know, it, it talks through the, hey, you know, there's this, you know, these kind of steps that you need to walk through and, you know, hey, let's not rush just to, hey, I'm going to go get a, an antivirus tool and slap it on and start implementation. But, you know, let's get, you know, a, a gap assessment done, which builds to a project plan so that we actually implement based off of a project. So, you know, just understanding, you know, what CMMC is, understanding the ways that you can get yourself through the whole process from tip to tail. We also have our Simple Helix CMMC solutions brief that, you know, talks about the solutions that we specifically have at Simple Helix. And we've bundled many parts and pieces along with adding managed services on top of those tools and those pieces to get you through quite a few of the controls. Uh, obviously with us, you know, we're focused in the, the IT space. So, you know, there's some sections of CMMC that relate to say the physical security of your office space. Well, you know, I don't have a solution for that. I can't help you with the physical solution, but I can absolutely help you with laptops, desktops, firewalls, all those type things. So we talk about that in that solutions brief. And then um, when you go to say like Microsoft Office 0365, you know, there's many, many license choices within that. And there's also different environments for meeting the different levels of CMMC. So we have tried to decomplicate that as much as possible with our O365 license map. And you can take a look at that and say, okay, yeah, I think um, I know my business, we need Word and Excel and Outlook and those things but I need to be in the right environment and that kind of help you get going in the right direction. And um, we also have another event coming up. So, you know, if you guys are in the, the sub contractor space and um, you're curious about, well, what are primes going to be doing when they get uh, a new contract that requires CMMC, what are they going to flow down to me? We have another event coming up where we've actually got together a couple of the, the CISOs from some prime contractors, and they're going to have a conversation and kind of share what it is that they are expecting to do and what they're prepping subcontractors for. And, you know, we'd welcome you all to come out and check that out. So with that, I hope, uh, yeah, I hope we got some questions rolling in. Uh, that's my favorite part of these presentations. Uh, Adam, I think you might be muted. I am indeed. How am I doing now? <laughs> First question, passed. <laughs> am I muted? Answer yes. So. <laughs> Uh, we have a few coming in, I think, on the uh, the questions here. So if you guys want to be able to type in a, a question for either of us, uh, please do so. Um, so oh, yeah, I see, I see a question that uh, I think I can run with, Adam, which was, uh, the question was, uh, have you ever had any customers stay on G Suite and be compliant with CMMC? So from our standpoint, uh, the answer there is yes. You can stay on G Suite for levels, say, one and two. When you start getting up into level three, from our perspective, you start having to do device management and, uh, you know, you got to start managing the fleet of laptops and desktops and stuff, which is something that G Suite doesn't organically do. Um, when it comes to another thing that G Suite organically does not do is the full end-to-end -end email encryption. So for levels one and two, what we could do is we can layer on another tool like uh, Prevail, for example, that could plug into your G Suite that would enable you to have the end-to-end -end email encryption. 
And then as you move up in the CMMC level three and you start moving the needle and saying, yeah, I got to start, you know, making sure that laptops and desktops have hard drive and quick encryption turned on. I got to have asset management. I got to have, you know, uh, whitelisting and blacklisting of applications that are installed on those things. Those are things that just don't organically happen with G Suite that can organically happen with O365. And so like for us at Simple Helix, we do see the majority of our customers at that point make a transition over to O365. Yeah, just to add on, I mean, sometimes you look at other cloud providers, email and SaaS apps are one thing. There's also IAS, like uh, infrastructure as a service. You look at, you know, teams like Amazon, Microsoft, and of course, Google and Oracle and others putting together hosting facilities, um, you know, fr from a CMMC perspective and, you know, NIST 853, the, the idea that the FebRAMP certified facilities are going to be places you're going to be putting some of this data. Uh, it's also another consideration, I think, for when you think about re in some cases for those infrastructure services that's going to come up. Uh, you can check the compliance for a lot of these things out on the websites uh, for these programs. So, you know, Azure and you know, Amazon will tell you which facility is covered and which one isn't. Uh, it's a shortcut to understanding whether or not your hosting is going to be sufficient. If you got, you know, some spreadsheet up there, it's it's part of your, your vendors, right? And you should be categorizing those as, you know, in a good place, well, the GovCloud or in a, in a place that doesn't have all the right certifications for the facility. They haven't been inspected. So check those out as well. See what your providers are using for their hosting facilities and you know, understanding where their data centers are is a, is a great way to understand that facility security clearance to maintain that. But of course, what Scott said is, is bang on, right? It, it's more than just email. There's gonna be so many things that the Microsoft suite has um, that are on a great CMMC enablers, of course, with a single platform, but you know, also from a cybersecurity perspective, I can't tell you the amount of cyber attacks that you know policy would have defended right simple policy not advanced supreme antivirus or in, in an incredibly intelligent host firewall or network firewall it is a you know sometimes just a simple game of making sure application whitelisting is enabled and you know microsoft natively enables these tools if you're using microsoft laptops you can harden them to the point that that mm -hmm. security is applied by default and so uh, it's just a simple way to do things you just need to have somebody explain how these things work um, so shameless plug again, take the free session, take the half an hour session. I can talk you through things like that. We can point you to Scott and the team to, uh, to handle these kinds of things. Um, you know, uh, even through a conversation. Right? Yeah. And then, um, you know, one of the things, one of the, another topic I wanted to, you know, kind of circle back on, which was, you know, the theme of our presentation was, all right, well, I, I see this thing coming down the pike, right? There's this, this thing I hear, the CMMC compliance standard, it's about cybersecurity. Uh, I, I know that I'm going to be working in the defense industrial base. I'm going to have to do something, but how do I know what is the level I got to go start working towards? And there, there's a couple things that are going to move that needle. And, you know, one obviously is, you know, it will show up on a RFP that will specifically call out that you need to hit a very specific CMMC level. Alternatively, if you're working with a prime, the prime could pass down and say, hey, as a sub, I want you to be CMMC this level. Um, and then there's also just your business as a whole going, well, I want to be cyber secure understanding what the different levels is and I will go achieve a level because that's what we strategically want to do for our organization. Now, with that said, um, obviously those are three swim lanes, but you know, we also know that um, the original or the, the predecessor to CMMC DFARS, it had 110 controls those 110 controls all exist at the CMMC level three. So there is kind of this, you know, center of the bell curve target to go after. And, you know, if you were already under DFARS, then you've already done 110 controls. The idea being, okay, now I got to add on 20 more controls and I'll be CMMC level three. So, you know, if you were looking at us as a, you know, a bell curve histogram kind of thing, yeah, set level three is sort of the, 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 the big target that 
Uh, I know at least here at Simple Helix, we see most people trying to go achieve. And then, you know, for the levels four and five, you know, things do get much more expensive. They get compoundedly more difficult to go solve. And so from that perspective, you know, it gets a, a lot harder and more expensive to get up there. But um, hey, Adam, what do you think about it? You know? Yeah, I think that certainly the mandate is going to be uh, for our customers. The mandate gets passed down by the by their kind of biggest provider, right? Like that's that's kind of where before an RFP hits their desk and somebody says, "Go do this so we can win." I think where it's organically going to start as a selection process to keep the customers you have. Who who are the customers that exactly. push you into a particular level of compliance? And then the same question IT always gets relative security, what are we doing about all this, right? What, what, we've got hundreds of controls, let's go, right? Like what, your boss wants to know tomorrow when you're gonna be done and what, what tools do we have? Uh, and I see another another great question in, in the chat that actually kind of dovetails to this, right? Um, what do you recommend for, right? Because I think you're gonna go through this assessment, you're gonna see people process technology, you're gonna see uh, tech categories that, you know, identity management, identity and access management, identity processors, you're gonna, you're gonna wonder, okay, well, can I go to an Okta? Can I go to a, can I stick with AD? What's AD in the cloud look like, MFA, et cetera. So there's gonna be a lot of that tooling conversation. And one of the more difficult tools uh, that you know you have to work with in cyber is something called data loss prevention, right? And the science you know, is in the name, right? People think that this is gonna be a product that you're going to deploy, that's gonna understand where your sensitive information is and prevent it from escaping, right? And, you know, such is the trick that everybody tries to, you know, deconstruct, right? Everybody wants to look at this product and go, well, there's 7 million exceptions to that rule, right? Like, what if somebody wrote it down on a piece of paper? And how about the printouts that we have to, you know, mail away securely? And what about the engineering diagrams that are binaries? They're these large 50 gig files. Like, how are you going to stop the movement of that? And what about USB key? And what about a CD? And what about, you know, a telephone call? And for years of my life, so I was a master certified with a company called Volunteer get acquired with uh, at Symantec a long time ago. And so I've spent years of my life in this exact position where as not only a technology consultant, but as a process consultant, I was uh, using it for things like ITAR compliance. Uh, you know, uh, if you if you're, uh, understand those export restrictions, you understand the kind of documents and the kind of companies that I was working with. You know, we have MIX or, you know, some special, you know, three letter agency as our, as our clients. Some things are air gapped. Right. So you're looking at that and going. We're not going to get any software there. We're not going to get any, you know, details on this stuff. And, and here's what I'd say is that by and large, these tools are trying to use the content and the way that it's used to uh, set up certain alerts or, or, or things that allow you to at least detect and hopefully prevent the loss of information. Right. But one of the key things that you should be doing is understanding that by limiting your attack surface, by limiting the amount of ways that an application can be used and data can be sent in the first place, just the application, you cut down all the factors tremendously. By letting people install their own software, you have one thing. By allowing any cloud provider using your, your laptops and machines, you now, you're now you exponentially creating those avenues, right? And so for unstructured data like retailers and credit cards, you know, there's that whole false positive thing, right? A lot of things look like a credit card number in, in, in IT. Uh -huh. uh, and there's a lot of ways for that credit card number to leave, right? And so just understanding that it's not a perfect science and starting with the idea that you're going to just dictate how acceptable usage is performed with your company, what cloud apps you have, creating policies around the installation of unused software, simple things that just reduce the amount of data transit mechanisms and a good security awareness program will help you kind of get through uh, even basic things like privacy controls, right? Maybe you're in the UK and you're worried about GDPR. Maybe you have, you know, uh, very large documents that technologically you're not going to be able to create something that stops that engineering diagram from being copied to USB if it's enabled in certain cases, like maybe we use encrypted only. So there's a lot of use cases that you start to create the more avenues you have. Lock down your machines to start. Uh, look at whether you're using unstructured big document data or structured data. And then as soon as you have those use cases documented, that's when the time is to go shopping. Right now for me to tell you in a vacuum, you know, Vertisys or Semantic DLP or, you know, uh, Raytheon is, is the best for you because, because, because it, it's too hard to say in just what's the best one because it's really use case specific. And in many cases, you don't want a DLP. All you want is sort of a flight recorder like EDR 
that can watch what your software is doing, right? The kind of things that Shameless Plug are included in manage detection and response. So that if you suspect bad things from happening, um, you have a sort of recording of what's going on, right? File analysis, uh, another great opportunity for you to see what permissions did someone have before they leave? What documents did they access? Are there document patterns, you know, sort of out of whack with normal access behavior? Simple things like that that can kind of get ahead of HR related insider threat issues rather than can we make sure every kind of document and issue we have around sensitive data can't can't leave, right? Which lockdown use case. Hope that answers. I mean, I could go on for obviously multiple years and have on this yeah. subject. So hey, Adam, we do uh, have another question that came in and the question was um, to perform an effective gap analysis, does the company need to have completed a self-assessment using the NIST 800-171? I can certainly answer that. Well, yeah, to yeah. That. Happy to do. Okay. So NIST 800-171, a, <laughs> because there, there was versions of this too, right? Uh, if you were kind of working with DFARS before, this was sort of the standard that a lot of people, and there was, you know, Exostar portals, Lockheed, and a whole bunch of other people that had, uh, you know, use this standard as uh, almost like the precursor. I'm not going to say it's the direct precursor because it's related to, and if you download the tracker, you'll see exactly where it's related so that you're not confused about the overlap. And I think you as well have like the NIST 800-171 areas of the controls and some of the giveaways as well, Scott. But, uh, you know, you don't need to have done a NIST 800-171 audit to do a gap analysis of yourself. You can take the tracker, which is all the controls that are in CMMC at every level and fill it out to know where you're at across each. And then that'll tell you what your gaps are, right? If you want to then know from those controls, which ones would have made your NIST 800-171 compliant, go for it. But the truth is that if you're going to get audited by somebody who's giving you the CMMC certification, NIST 800-171 might have given you a bit of a leg, uh, a, 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 a a running start mm -hmm. at CMMC, but they're not the same thing. So you do want to just do CMMC, I think, uh, from start to finish. Even if you have done NIST 800-171, you probably answered these questions before, so it's a copy paste job. Uh, but um, certainly you don't have to start at, at 171 to do a self-assessment on, on CMMC. And I would agree with that 100%. And um, you know what we see frequently at Simple Helix is that people started working on their DFARS or the, the NIST 800-171 controls and somewhere in the middle of it, the momentum got lost, right? So not all 110 controls actually got implemented. And so from that perspective, you know, what we really kind of see is we'll go back and just do, like you're saying, Adam, do the CMMC assessment because you did some work on DFARS, what that's gonna mean is you're gonna answer yes more frequently when you do the CMMC gap analysis, but um, you know you, you don't have to do the, the DFARS first before jumping into CMMC, you can go straight to CMMC. And you know, from that perspective, you know, there, there is the conversation that when you do go get CMMC level three, and you're holding that certification, you can actually reverse flow that back to cover your DFARS. So uh, from that perspective, but you can't do it the other way. You can't uplift DFARS in the CMMC. So from our perspective, you know, yeah, absolutely just go straight for the CMMC and then let it flow back down into DFARS as opposed to trying to do DFARS first and stepping up in the CMMC. And, and don't get dejected, guys. If you've done your 171, ah, oh, yes, good point. This amount of overlap. Think of CMMC as a superset. It's not wasted work. You didn't waste your life over the last three years. They tried to preserve as much when they made CMMC uh, of the controls they were using from DFARS and 171. But uh, you'll see that exact mapping, of course. And, and, and Scott, you're bang on. So, uh, super quick one. This is an easy one. Uh, I love taking the easy ones. Are we sharing the recording at the end? Uh, yes, this is on Bright Talk. This is not, you know, stage gated. We're not going to make you pay money for this or, you know, do all kinds of other stuff. Just if you sign up for Bright Talk, log in and, and you'll be able to find this, uh, this recording in its entirety and the materials. Uh, we do have a couple more minutes. I'm going to plug the next step slide, I guess, because that's kind of a, you know, we kept talking about, you know, do CMMC self assess Check out the resources here at the bottom uh, of the webinar if you're on it. Um, the self-assessment at CMC, you'll see it. It's kind of a, like a spreadsheet. Fill that out. You can book time with uh, Intelligo uh, 
or a readiness consultant cons consultation. This will help you essentially with your system security plan. We can talk you through what that is and, and how it relates to the self-assessment, but the right place to start is the self-assessment and then book time to talk. And then uh, from there, essentially, uh, you know, Simple Helix and Intelligo can engage uh, can engage with you uh, to answer a lot more of these questions in much more detail. Uh, probably the the real you know the real answers, the stuff we wouldn't say on a generic webinar. Um, um, yeah, so there was one more question that sneaked in while we were kind of wrapping up that uh, I think is a good, actually a good question to go answer. So um, the question was, uh, how long until CMMC compliance becomes a requirement? I've heard anywhere from one to five years for full implementation. And so, um, yeah, I kind of want to take a swing at that one just for a quick second. So, um this is CMMC is absolutely a phased rollout standard. And so the standard itself got dropped at the bottom of January of this year. And the original timeline was that uh, third party assessors would get trained in March. Of course, there was this little thing that happened globally called COVID that uh, did impact the assessor training. But uh, assessors are coming online now here in October. They, you know, they were able to start getting that training in the summertime. Then uh, with the first uh, round or the first wave of assessors coming into the marketplace, the DOD would release 10 RFIs and 10 RFPs with a CMMC requirement. With that, you get the choice of whether you want to uh, move forward with that RFP. And then the other part that came up with uh, over the summertime is that they originally, when they were touting CMMC, it was you had to hold your CMMC certificate when you submitted your response for the RFP. The rule on that's now changed to the point of you can see the RFP, you can bid, you have to have your CMMC certification at time of award. So you now can continue moving down the path, but then if you tiptoe into that RFP, uh, there is a timer set and you gotta have that, this certification process done by the time that award would come around to you. Then, you know, like I mentioned, it's 10 RFPs this year. As we roll into the beginning of 2021, uh, the calendar 21, not the, the fiscal year 21, but you know, January, February timeframe, there will be another 75 that get released with a CMMC requirement. And then it just continues to grow after that, right? So um, with the with intent the, that in 2026, DFARS would be completely replaced with CMMC. I'll add one more thing. I mean, if you're on this call hoping to understand whether you should get the auditor certification, check out cmmcab.org. Uh, they've got some great yeah. resources for people who are looking to get accredited as an auditor. There's there's different areas of audit there. That's a little bit out of the scope of this, but uh, you know, like Scott said, they're, they're obviously looking to phase this into production. And I think where there, there's been a lot of anecdotes from our customers that already have a mandate from their CEO uh, to, to become compliant, you know, within end of year 2021. So I would say, you know, especially as you look at some of the project plans that we've seen developed, uh, it depends how far back you're starting from. And I think a lot of people, especially smaller agencies are, you know, significantly looking at revamping their operations in order to pull this off. And we all know what you guys make and, and how it works and that some of these systems are old and not segmented and we acquire companies. And so, you know, there, there, there certainly needs to be a process that you investigate right now, at least assess yourself and understand what your uh, potential project timelines look like, because as more auditors uh, are created and certifications are when the auditor gets you know out there and they're licensed to create the certification, that's really in my head when the certification starts. When people started enforcing it is a different thing. This happened with PCI, you know, mm -hmm. that day as well, right? They they would release yeah. but the thing and then they would create these you know levels of merchants and people would go out and, and they would do these audits. The QSA would come and do the report on compliance and then you know there were gaps, right? There were always going to be gaps, right? Nobody nobody's gap free on their first self assessment. And so, you know, there, there are these kind of arcs of time in which they become a little bit less 
okay, you know, you did pass, you didn't pass, you are using this, you're not using this, you got rid of this vulnerability, you didn't get rid of this. And so I, I think that, you know, there's, there's going to be auditors out there, some saying, you know, no leniency, right? You got an old piece of software, you know, you're not compliant, right? And we don't have enough practice of it to know whether you're going to fail your certification with problems like that necessarily, because that's something the community kind of figures out once they start putting this in there. Are there people getting their certification with vulnerabilities or with 2003 servers or with, you know, an XP machine or, you know, no group policy, right? It, 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 dep like, it, it depends on how you see this sort of enforced. But right now, the, the thinking is you fail one, you fail the whole thing. Uh, and that you look at these levels and that's your gimme, right? Is being able to hit a particular level. And that these auditors who might've been slowed down by the pandemic, there's provisional auditors, people are getting certified. They're moving through this very quickly. And this is a fairly sought after uh, certification. There are hundreds of thousands of organizations that do need this, this level of certification. So it's huge supply, great demand, right? Uh, sorry, very little supply, huge demand. People are going to want this certification. So if you're here to figure out if you should get the certification, if you're a U.S. citizen and you qualify, cmmcav.org, I'd say get it. Uh, if you're worried about the timelines to getting compliant, definitely figure out your own timelines right now, because I don't think that the, the certification and the mandate is going to be dictating it. I think that the conversations from higher level providers might preclude you if you're going through an RFP next year, because they want to make sure they're going with a vendor in a multi-year relationship, which most of these are that is compliant, right? That, that it at least has a plan to get compliant. So they're not, when they're doing their own vendor due diligence, that you're mapping to them, right? Yeah, and I mean, you know, from what I'm starting to see, you know, obviously like with us, you know, we have to go do an implementation, you know, uh, working through and, you know, nailing down an SSP and making sure that, you know, like the parts and pieces that we configure, match what's in your SSP, you know, that can take on the span of months, even for a, you know, a small business. And, and that's just because of calendar days, right? You got to, you know, Adam and I, we got to work through different pieces. We're, we're trying to make decisions. Are we applying a technical solution here or are we rewriting the SSP? Uh, we got to decide which one we're going to do. And of course, then you got to go and make those updates and all those things. And it, it does take time. And then I think one of the things where I think we'll all get uh, constricted and it's going to be a bottleneck is actually being able to find an assessor that can come do your assessment. So obviously, you know, like for us, you know, we could staff up and try to get lead times knocked down and, you know, Adam and you guys could do the same thing. But uh, for a while, you know, there will be a finite resource called those third party assessors and uh you know they're going to work in a first come first serve manner and um so you know you definitely don't you know i kind of view it as you know going up to the meat you know in the old days going up to the meat counter and pulling the ticket off the the reel right that um you know if uh or like in the beetlejuice right he pulls up like the two digit number and he looks up at the board and there's a million people in front of you um you know the uh you know, I, I do think that there will be some of that going on. So, you know, the sooner that you start, the better off you will ultimately be. Right. And uh, think about the supply chain problem. It, uh, I mean, if you're in the U.S. right now, it's like voting, right? There's there's a long line that's going to happen when hundreds of thousands of organizations need this to happen at a particular date when it becomes a certification problem to getting contracts. And honestly, then it's going to go to highest bidder. It's going to, it's going to increase the cost of audit. It, there, there's going to be a lot of issues if you're not ready to go and trying to start early at least provisionally right just getting your ducks in a row to know where you're at right and if you don't end up getting certified you know are your are your partners going to let you get away with here's our plan here's where we're at is this good enough we just can't get an auditor there's this gap time right nobody can say right right, right. we Except haven't gotten there yet yep we haven't gotten there yet but uh, certainly the earlier the better all right. There was one other question about um, if we're already using O365, do we need to implement Azure AD in order to be compliant at level three? Um, so at some point, there's got to be in AD somewhere. Um, and then like with us at Simple Helix, you know, we do marry, you know, on-prem existing Active Directory servers back into O365 so that, you know, there is that single source of truth for user accounts. 
what we see more frequently is that um, individuals do like the idea of not having to have that physical server or a virtual machine running within their office and definitely driven by COVID with everybody working from home, uh, picking that up and moving it to Azure AD is sort of a, it is a, a benefit to doing it that way. You don't have to do it that way. And um, we would just evaluate what's going on in your business there to decide which way you're, you're going, right? If, if you're in uh, manufacturing and you got a bunch of legacy applications, you know, that drive, you know, old presses and things like that, and they're expecting an Active Directory server to be there to function correctly, uh, yeah, you can't just rip and replace it. But maybe you're a, a newer company and you don't have some of those legacy tools or applications, then if you got the choice, you know, we would, of course, recommend that you just go as your active directory because it just uh, it just makes you more nimble, it makes you more flexible, uh, kind of future proofs you a little bit better. And if you're going to go through the effort of getting uh, can, you know, CMMC certified, you kind of want to future proof it the best you can. So, you know, it's a recommendation, but you don't have to do it that way. From a security perspective, if you are sitting on Office 365, I have to highlight, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a topic earlier that Scott brought up, which is what are you doing on your laptops, right? Or do you have group policy applied there, right? We talk about Azure in the cloud as if, you know, it's governing mostly when we say Office 365, I think people are just talking about, you know, Teams and SharePoint and their email, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, Office 365 and Azure kind of, I mean, it, they're very contiguous when you start to talk about management of your devices, right? Because, you know, maybe you're not running remote desktop in Azure, maybe your servers aren't in Azure. Maybe you're just asking if Azure Active Directory, the server is really governing the identities for Office 365, is that enough? And uh, like Scott said earlier, you know, no, it is not. Whether you are running a laptop or a server, you know, in or out of AD, it is governed by a policy. That policy cannot be delivered through Office 365. It is delivered by the governing tool that manages your laptops and your workstations in tune. Active Directory group policy. It's a function of, of uh, a Windows server. It's a server role that is, you know, not the directory of usernames and passwords. Multi-factor authentication. We talk about this all the time. Microsoft MFA. It's another server, right? It, it's got to do with adding tokenization to your identity process so people don't just lose their usernames and passwords, hack right in, right? So th there's a lot that happens in governing your Microsoft laptop, level one, two, and three, that is going to happen on these directory servers. And this is exactly Scott's point earlier when we talk about you know, anti-spams there in Office 365. But you know, in tune, you may have it, you may not. You may, we probably have no idea how to do all this stuff, right? So, you know, what's what's going to govern the policies on the workstation is a huge thing because from a threat perspective, there's so many times where we feel terrible that we get to an incident response case that beat the antivirus, beat something else, and they're like, what else could we have done? And it was like it, was, it is inside the software, it's in the restrictions you could apply in Active Directory. It is, there is a lot there. Yeah, I could belabor that forever. All right, uh, I think we're good. Any more questions? Feel free. I mean, you. I think you know how to get in touch with us. You know, R two D two is behind there. You just have to be able to drop the code in, and he'll come and get us with the emergencies. Uh, but you can contact us. Use the, the the links below. I appreciate all of your time, Scott. Thank you so yeah. much for joining us today. I hope you found this helpful. I hope you join the next Simple Helix webinar and uh, get in touch with us for that free consultation. Fill out that stuff and uh, make it to CMMC level five as fast as you can. There you go. All right, yeah, it was great. And uh, yeah, again, my, my sentiments as well. Thank you everybody for joining and look forward to talking with you all soon. Cheers. Thanks, Scott. Bye. Bye-bye.